Uh, um, special thank you to the development committee member and former Chronicle editor in chief Ann Newman for helping us plan this talk with Emily and for suggesting it in the first place. Hi guys, I'm Chrissy Beck. I'm, I'm the general manager here at the Chronicle. Thanks for coming. If you guys need anything, just drop a question in the chat or a line to me personally, and I'll be happy to help out. And if you have any questions, um, you can drop them in the chat and we'll collect them and get them to Emily and John here in just a little bit. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah, we're really excited to have you all here. And uh, with that, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome a former Chronicle editor and board member, John Hilsenrath from the Wall Street Journal. John, I think you're still muted. Hey, John, I think you're still muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Two years into COVID, I still haven't figured out how to do this. Um, thank you uh, for including me in this. Um, I love doing events with the Chronicle, so excited to do this. Emily and I have some, done some stuff before, too, so it's uh, exciting to, to um, get a chance to talk to Emily about her journalistic um, endeavors. So let, let me just start out with a couple of preliminaries. First of all, I see we've got a good crowd here. Um, I'm gonna ask questions, but uh, I'm hoping this will be an interactive conversation. So please uh, pop your questions uh, out there as, uh, Chrissy, can, can you remind me, remind the audience how to get their questions uh, out in front of everybody? Yeah, there's a little chat button at the very bottom of your screen or at the bottom of your phone. If you just drop it in the general chat to everyone, we will we'll make sure they get to the right place and get to John. Okay, great. So uh, don't hold back. In the meantime, I'm just gonna get into it. So Emily is uh, an international correspondent for NPR. Uh, some of you wake up in the morning uh, hearing her uh, correspondence from China, and uh, you should know she's been up working all day while you're drinking your coffee. Uh, she was formerly a Financial Times reporter. She's won numerous awards for her coverage on human rights and other issues. Uh, among them, she was a finalist for the Livingston Award for Achievement uh, in 2021 for journalists under 35. And among the stories that I would like to hear about was a piece she's done on the ancient art of pigeon whistling. But before we get to that big issue, I wanna talk about uh, some other smaller issues related to global affairs. Starting out with uh, war in Ukraine. China is in an unusual position. Uh, President Xi was forging a closer relationship with, uh, with Vladimir Putin right before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. So Emily, can you talk us talk to us a little bit about the geopolitical environment from your perspective there in Beijing? How does China's leadership view the situation diplomatically vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, the United States? How are they managing uh, what, what's happening in Ukraine right now? Sure. First of all, thanks everyone for joining your evening. and. I see some familiar faces. I think I worked with um, Dana and Julian at the Chronicle while I was at Duke. So thanks for joining. It's great to see you too. Um, with regards to China, Russia, it's been incredibly interesting, even though unfortunately the substance of the coverage itself has literally just been reading foreign ministry statements, which is like most unsatisfying thing ever. But, uh, this is really shaping up to be one of the biggest policy blunders that Xi Jinping has made in the last couple of years. I think despite all the speculation about how much did China know, how much did it not know before Russia invaded, because remember Putin was the only among the only foreign leaders who came to Beijing 
uh, for the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics in late February. And they had a big meeting and they released a joint statement. Ostensibly, Putin might have said something about the fact that he was going to invade another country then. Despite all the speculation that maybe she did know the extent of what Putin was planning to do, I don't think he knew the exact details and he didn't know how awful it was going to be because they would not have released such an extensive joint statement so early on. They may have said something about how they're friends, but they wouldn't have made such a big deal about it at the time and then have it look like egg on Xi's face in, in two weeks after that. But given that China's hitched its wagon to Russia, it long-term is doubling down on its strategic partnership with Russia. It's not a total formal alliance and there's a lot of limits to this partnership. But China sticking with Russia, you see that in the messaging and in, in Chinese state propaganda here, you see that among most public opinion actually about what Chinese citizens think about the war in Ukraine. And for China, it's a bit of a gamble. It's probably more bold of a gamble than she would have liked, but the risks are high and the payoff could be higher. The potential payoff is if Russia does manage to come out of this all right, if Putin stays alive, if they manage to keep the Donbass or maybe even push further west in Ukraine, then that would further distract the West, so to speak, mostly the EU and the US in this case from China. The US has tried its best to signal foreign policy wise that it's still keeping its eye on China during all of this, but there's finite resources and it's clear that the, the discussion globally is moving towards Ukraine right now rather than Chinese sanctions, Chinese officials and policy. And um, <clears throat> that Western resolve, particularly on sanctions against Russia are going to crack. And um, the economic cost will bite. The EU is going to back down on whether on on how much it wants to move away from Russian gas, and we're going to see divisions emerge potentially from NATO and from uh, the US and the EU. That's China's ideal scenario that you see more of a multipolar world, a more regional um, order to the world, and the the Russian war, the war in Ukraine is, is um, an acceleration of what China sees a trend, uh, the trend that China already sees in a, in a declining West. So anyways, really, really big, vague concepts. Who knows if it'll actually happen? The situation seems to be changing day by day and the story seems to be changing week by week in Ukraine. Um, and that's, that's quite scary for China because it likes to control things. It wants to know the outcome. Let's talk for a second about sanctions, because uh, this is an, an important part where China's entanglements with Russia and the United States interconnect. So uh, one potential way around sanctions for the Russians is to come to the Chinese for, for banking, for foreign exchange, et cetera. Uh, how worried is China's leadership that, uh, that, that it's going to get caught up in a Western sanctions program and how are they trying to position themselves around that? Well, in some ways China's already been caught up in a Western sanctions program. Obviously they're not incredibly um, extreme sanctions. They're on a limited number of companies and individuals, but it's enough, I think, to give Chinese policymakers a taste of what could happen if they, they were cut off from the SWIFT messaging system. So they've been really, really careful so far. You know, I don't, I don't talk to Chinese officials, they don't talk to anyone, which is also part of the problem. But given the fact that they haven't helped the Russians, they uh, are so far, according to the White House, following every single sanction so far, they're not sending, um, they haven't broken sanctions, that they're they're quite fearful of, of that so far. But that's kind of a, you know, American sanctions are a bit of a one and done thing. You know, once you, once you roll out the hardest sanctions, you basically see what they're capable of. And if you don't stick by them, or if the impact's not severe enough, there's nothing that much more you can do. So for China, this is a learning exercise. They're also viewing the situation and seeing what happens. What's the worst case scenario if the US did sanction China and cut it off from some of the global institutions that it relies on right now for its economy? China's making plans to have its own digital currency, it's building up its own foreign reserves. It is preparing for the worst case scenario slowly and slow, but but it's also um, it's also mapping out just how long the EU and the US will stick by this and say one day in the off chance that China decides to invade Taiwan, not a certainty, but definitely a possibility. It has a bit of a roadmap to understand what the US might do to, to China. 
Well, let's talk about the Taiwan question. Uh, how, how, how do you size up the, um, the, the leadership's thinking on, on an issue like that? They potentially have a great deal to lose. They also, from their own perspective, have a great deal to gain by doing it. I think it's a complete toss up. I think there are people at the most senior levels of the Chinese leadership who haven't decided whether or not they want to invade Taiwan and when. And I think that's a scary bit because if they did decide to invade, it would be another thing that would completely change our world and the global order. And it's not gonna happen immediately. You know, this is not something that's gonna happen, I think in the next two to five years, it's something more medium term. And it's something China is building up to. It's definitely, preparing itself for that event, for that possibility. Um, but I have no insight and as to whether or not it's going to happen. People in China don't want it to happen for what it's worth. No one wants to go fight a war. No one wants their children to go die somewhere else. And China hasn't fought a war ever really. So um, let's see, there's a lot of extreme. I mean, Taiwanese people look and speak they, they look the same as Chinese people. They speak basically the same language. There's so much exchange between the two, the two countries. Um, the Chinese pop culture scene up until about the mid 2000s was dominated by Taiwanese people. It's Taiwanese people who made all the pop music here in China, all the movies um, uh, and also Hong Kong. Uh, this is an aspect that, that puzzles me about uh, the leadership's position kind of vis-a-vis the West and, and Russia right now, you talked about its hope for a multipolar world. Um, you know, from kind of my naive perspective in the United States, China's uh, embrace of the global trading system, its involvement in the global trading system lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Uh, its trade with the United States was an economic boom for the country. Why would they want to move? Towards a multipolar, uh, a, a, a multipolar world where they're pivoting away uh, from Taiwan and the United States and, and, and the West. What's in it for them? They are trying to become more self-reliant for what it's worth. It's going to be a big question in the next in the next decade about whether they can do that. And for better or worse, the COVID pandemic gave China the reason to be isolated. They've closed their borders. Borders still remain sealed. This is why I haven't gone home and why it's taken so long to plan a trip back home. And that's had a massive impact on, on investor confidence in China. It's temporarily boosted exports because luckily for China, everyone else was also locked down and buying Chinese goods, but that's not going to last for very long. The Shanghai lockdown that's ongoing right now is incredibly severe, and there are already uh, foreign chambers of commerce that have said, listen, we've enjoyed zero tolerance COVID for two years, and that's made China a stable place to operate. But actually now zero COVID is becoming an extremely unstable policy because of how infectious Omicron, for example, and we can't afford to be locked down every three weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, that's having a short-term impact on the Chinese economy. It's it okay. shrunk in the first quarter for the first time last year. It's not going to meet its GDP targets this year. But the indication is leaders are willing to take that hit now because they see how the world is going. They don't expect to rely on trade with the EU and the US long term, though that's certainly a huge chunk of their economy right now. And that's particularly European relations. They've got to shore, shore up over the Ukraine issue. Um, but they're making a, a real bid to be more regionally dependent rather than having global yeah, I mean, globalization I, I is sort of breaking it, down over here. Last time I looked, uh, I think net exports were something like 20% of GDP, which is twice, which makes China twice as dependent on global trade as the United States. Um, you, you raised COVID. Let's drill down a little bit on that. Um, describe the state of play there. And one of the things that I'm curious about is there's there's been a lot of uh, pushback in the United States about lockdowns and mask policies and such. Obviously, we're, we're in a much different political and social environment in the United States as you are in China. But what's your sense of kind of how uh, people are responding to the lockdowns and whether that's a potential source of unrest or, um, uh, or um, instability uh, for the country? 
people are responding. I think Shanghaiers are really special. They're very outspoken. They're pretty apolitical, but they're wealthy and they're used to having global connections. And it's an extremely cosmopolitan city. And they've been really lucky over the last two years, despite zero COVID. They've basically had the best public, best public health system, the best public health advisors, and they've been much more relaxed over there with controls than they have been in Beijing, for example. And they haven't really had any major outbreaks. So for the Chinese leadership, it's really unlucky that in the midst of a kind of politically sensitive year, that Shanghai has been the city that's been hit so hard because it's quite visible. It's really hard to hide information that comes from Shanghai. And it could be a turning point in China's COVID policy. There's not going to be widespread social unrest. That can be controlled relatively easily now these days because everyone is literally stuck inside their homes and everything online is monitored. But that unrest from an individual level is being noted and recorded, I'm sure, by the Chinese leadership and by the central leadership. And that feedback might hasten some kind of opening up maybe next year after the party congress, which is a big convocation of all the party leaders this October, and it happens every five years. So it's good public feedback. And I think this is the first time where you've seen public opinion tilt slightly towards dissatisfaction towards zero COVID. It might surprise a lot of people, but people in China, for the most part, really, really like zero COVID. They're willing to put up with the general cost from day to day. Most of the time, statistically speaking, the hardest costs are not falling on the average Chinese person. They're falling on a very, very targeted neighborhood or a small city that's been locked down for three or four weeks so the rest of the country can operate as normal. And people are willing to, are willing to bear that risk. But in Shanghai, I think it's really hitting very, very hard. It's hitting foreign residents and businesses hard. And they've been extremely vocal as well. And so you may see some kind of shift down the road in, in COVID policy. But in the short term, China has said repeatedly, we're not easing up. We're doing zero COVID all the way in Shanghai, no matter how long it takes, even though it kind of looks like the siege of Leningrad at this point. So two things I want to follow up on. One, one is you, um, you talked a little bit about social stability. I think anyone who spent any time in China understands that for the leadership, their stability is like one of the kind of primary objectives in almost everything it does. Do you see it, it, any signs of instability or, or, uh, any, or, it, or, or any signs that uh, the leadership would kind of change its approach to kind of managing the economy uh, or issues like COVID, like, like COVID because of social unhappiness or unrest brewing over how the, the how the economy or how the country is managed. Completely. I think the economy is the, is the biggest example of that. And you're already seeing warning signs that there is going to be massive unemployment in China and perhaps even a small depression the next year because of lockdowns like what's happening in Shanghai. And Xi Jinping had made this big policy package last year called Common Prosperity. I don't know what it means. No one knows what it really means, but broadly he wanted to decrease social inequality. He wanted more control over Chinese tech companies. He wanted stronger data privacy laws. He wanted companies to give back more to society, whatever that means. All on paper, great things, but in practice and implementation, it was extremely, you know, um, ax rather than scalpel. And on top of the COVID pandemic that really started to hit small businesses and private industry and state firms, which still comprise something like 60% of the economy also were not happy with this, but you know they can't really say anything because they're owned by the state. So you saw a bit of a reversal of those policies because they've led to huge amounts of un unemployment. Um, there are a lot of people who are working in the tech sector, programmers, teachers who are working in the education sector that were laid off last year because those companies just ceased to exist. I mean, um, the private education industry here was basically outlawed in one night. And uh, there was a meeting a few weeks ago. This is a bit in the weeds and I didn't really report on it too much for NPR, but there was a meeting last week in which the premier of the country said, and typical kind of sideways party speak, that there needed to be better implementation, that the market came first, that entrepreneurs had to be protected. And this reading between the lines was pushback against these policies that Xi Jinping had put forth. 
he said that regulators had to be the ones who had the first say about how to design the best policies so they didn't hurt small businesses, I'm paraphrasing heavily, rather than political objectives coming first. And so I think we're, we might see a bit of a shift away or at least you know, a tactful um, silence about you know, what happened to common prosperity and all of these um, enterprise regulations that were mentioned last year and were heavily featured in state news and propaganda and might not be so prominent this year as lockdowns take, um, and, and the Ukrainian war, take a big hit on the Chinese economy. So you, you, talk, you talked about the miscalculation that she made on, on Russia. Uh, we're talking about rising unemployment being uh, a source of concern, the zero lockdown policies. I realize this is very difficult to see from almost any vantage point in China, but do you have any sense that Xi's grip on power uh, it is is in any way threatened in ways that A, might result in a change of leadership or B, might result in some change of tactic on his part. You, I, I, you know, I think it's important that people understand that in no place, Russia or China is one person kind of solely in control. He's got a lot of forces kind of underneath him in the party that are constantly jockeying for his attention and um, what, what, what's your set, your sense of the internal dynamics there of the party and whether there's any flux at play? So this is completely my weak point. Unlike many other people, I don't find elite politics particularly interesting, mostly because it's just so opaque. So it's, it's, it's all speculation at a certain point, unless maybe you're the CIA. I don't think there's meaningful, uh, meaningful opposition to Xi Jinping in the party. There's certainly a lot, particularly among his generation of other party princelings and descendants of, of senior party officials. People who are old enough, you know, in their 60s or 70s to remember what it was like in the late 70s and 80s for China to open up politically and economically and are upset that Xi Jinping is walking back a lot of those, um, particularly on the political side, liberties, relatively speaking, that China enjoyed up until the, mid, the, the early 2000s. He's done a number of things that have really pissed people off. The big thing, the biggest thing first was repealing the constitutional um, provision that limited his term limits. That really, really scared some officials and party officials. And you saw some quiet petitions and essays from politically well-connected people opposing that. Though in the end, there was no political action to block that. The vote to get rid of that amendment passed almost unanimously. The second thing that really pissed people off, and this is more broad, is that China's been much more outspoken. This is the famed wolf warrior diplomacy stuff. And it's, it's you know, for all the kind of the hokey name, it's very much a, a phenomenon and, and journalists, for example, feel the brunt of it in China. Um, and some people are not happy with the way that China has raised its voice in a way that's sometimes self-destructive and called more attention to the country. And they blame say US sanctions on Chinese officials on uh, the fact that Xi Jinping has kind of played his hand too soon and too obviously. And um, the third thing that people are unhappy about is COVID. I think even though zero COVID was probably the thing that China needed to do the first year of the pandemic <clears throat> to figure out exactly how this virus worked and how it would impact the country, zero COVID is only as successful as how you're able to open up step by step as well. Otherwise, you're simply procrastinating. You know, do you want 3 million people to die in China in 2020 or in 2025 if you don't manage this transition well? And I think people are really starting to feel that COVID has been an excuse to stymie a lot of political reforms and to impose more political controls. So um, that all being said, you don't really see organized opposition to him. There might be some within the political compound in the center of Beijing, but it's going to be on a very, very individual level rather than systemic. You're not going to see say entire ministries come out and oppose Xi Jinping. In the case of that meeting that I mentioned, I mean, that's Xi Jinping's personal, they have a good relationship and top economic advisor kind of quietly coming out and saying what he thinks, but he's not making a big deal out of it. And the premier also doesn't have a faction behind him, you know, a lot of supporters. So he's not a political threat to Xi Jinping either. It's safe for him and he knows it to make these kind of remarks. Um, I think for sure Xi Jinping <clears throat> is going to have a third term come October as party chairman which is the most meaningful title. It's more powerful than being president of the country. It means more to be the head of the Communist Party in China. But beyond that, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. 
but beyond that, I, I don't know what could happen. And, and you may see grassroots opinion change about him. But right now he's, in, he's incredibly popular on, on a grassroots level. Um, and I don't see that changing in the next couple of years. All right. So I, I want to shift the focus a little bit and talk. We've been talking about Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin. Now I want to talk about you. Um, tell us how, how long you've been in China and, and how you got there. What was your journey? What's your journey been uh, to become an international correspondent uh, in Beijing for NPR? I, so I've been here for almost seven years and probably nearing the end of that time. In a few years time, I moved here as a freelancer right after I graduated college. And I got really lucky because that was probably the last year that that was possible. They really started to crack down on uh, work visas, on foreign media. I think surveillance became much more of an issue. And so it wasn't safe anymore to freelance. And so I quickly joined a paper, the Financial Times, and then after a few years jumped to NPR, which I've, I've loved. I think it's much more of the type of journalism that I wanted to do. But I had a lot of doubts along the way. Like Anne, who's on the call, can attest to the fact that maybe the first, I think it was the second year maybe, first year that I was in China, I thought about moving back. When I came here, I thought it was going to be a three-year thing. I would learn as much as I could and then and then move back to the US. It's been far longer than that. And I want to stay for at least two or three more years. Um, and the story has developed in ways that keep the job interesting. But um, there have been times where I thought, why, why am I doing this? It's been particularly frustrating now with COVID. Um, you know, I haven't taken a reporting trip in the last three months, which for some people who had been locked down for a year or two in the US doesn't sound so bad, but that had been the big draw, I think, of being in China, despite all of the extra personal costs of being stuck here. And now it's nearly it's nearly impossible to leave Beijing. So uh, and, and I want to drill down on, on that. But, but first, I want to um, follow up on your, your personal journey. So you decided to go over there as a freelancer. Uh, tell us more about that. That's quite a leap, I would think. You know, it's one thing to go over sees with the job, uh, it seems like quite, quite a bigger leap uh, in terms of the risk a person's willing to take to go overseas without a job and find work. So how, like, how, did, how did you think about, um, about that, that leap and how much uncertainty came with it? A, a lot, but I also think it was an, a relatively easy place to move as a freelancer. I mean, there are people who were freelancing and covering like the Afghan war, which I thought was crazy, but they did it and I admire them for it. I, I did do some research. I had actually been thinking about moving to Myanmar as a freelancer first. That seemed like a really interesting story. The uh, fledgling democracy there still looked like it had a bit of a chance when I graduated, but I, I actually did go my spring semester uh, of my senior year at Duke to Myanmar and felt that something was off. The local media ecosystem was just not as developed as I thought it was going to be. It was extremely expensive to live in Myanmar. So that was a financial consideration. Rental space, like housing stock was extremely limited and the US embassy was expanding there. And so renting an apartment was astronomically expensive. And the Rohingya thing was starting to become a mainstream issue and people were getting fired over it in the English speaking media. <clears throat> And as a freelancer, I would have no protection from that whatsoever. So I decided to move to China instead. I knew some journalists here. I could get a sense of what their work rhythms and mechanisms were. And I already spoke the language. So it was, it was a great medium of being a foreign place. You know, I'm not, I had never really spent time in Beijing before. It's very, very different from the part of China where my family had come from. And I had visited a few times, but I spoke the language and I was vaguely familiar with some of the issues at the time. Right. Um, for, for what it's worth, I'll draw some parallels with my own experience. That I picked up and went to Hong Kong in 1996 after finishing up some graduate school work, also without a job. And I also ended up staying there about two or three times longer than I expected. I didn't come back until almost 2001. So I think there's something to be said here for taking 
calculated leaps or calculated risks early in your career, they, they can lead you to some pretty cool and interesting assignments. Um, so uh, a few questions that, that uh, let's drill down on. Um, one, you kind of re referred to this about kind of being stuck in Beijing. Emily asks, how are you picking up on grassroots opinions? Um, if your travel has been limited, how, what are you doing to try to stay connected to the place and you know and, and keep yourself out there, so to speak? Mostly social media and online media. People have an incredibly prolific online life here in China. They're really well connected. It's not as um, you know broadband's not as great as it is in South Korea, but four and five G here is incredibly cheap. People are on their phones all the time and they're posting stuff that might get taken down. But if you're constantly reading that stuff, you can kind of get a sense of what people care about each day and and what the, the landscape of public discussion is, even if it gets shut down the day after. Um, so like so so describe that social media world to us. Um, one has to assume it's very carefully monitored uh, by uh, Chinese spies, the leadership, whatever you want to call it. Um, how dangerous is that for people to use as a medium for, you know, interacting with you? And how much of a window is that for you into kind of what, what what's happening on the ground in the place? It's, it's a way to reach out to people. It's a, how we find a lot of people if we're not doing reporting trips and we're trying to schedule interviews remotely. In terms of actually reaching out to people, I have a really wonderful producer and she does that. And uh, I think she's a little bit less monitored than I am, but there's always that risk that you might do an interview with someone and they'll want to retract it later. Increasingly, you see people doing interviews because they often believe as they should that speaking to the media might help their case, but then they'll, um, then they'll say, actually, I, I don't want you to air my interview at all because you're Americans and I'm worried that I actually might get in more trouble for speaking to an American outlet than I would if I just stayed completely silent and let, let them walk all over me. How and um, that just means you've got to interview more people. There's no way around it. How, how monitored are you? I don't know. And I'm not particularly concerned. It's a bit of a complicated question because Partially, there's just fewer foreign journalists here, so it's much easier to monitor those that remain like me. I think also I'm a bit more visible and uh, maybe outspoken. And uh, I think on a, on a broad level, pretty closely monitored, but on like a minute level, you know, like what I'm messaging each day to my mother or what I'm saying to my producer over iMessage, not so much, um, but who knows? I mean, it's extremely common to do a reporting trip and have police waiting for you by the time you've got there or to have people cancel your interview even though you've set it up two days before because somehow your communication with them has been found out or to visit someone and then have them visited by local officials a few hours later. I have no idea how that technology works, but I think they're triaging a number of um, probably mostly like cell phone data and messaging stuff. And also I have to buy all transportation with my passport number. So that's for sure monitored. Um, but luckily we don't have a, that much censorship. And I think there's a distinction between surveillance and censorship. As the foreign press, we're not censored. We can do whatever we want. We can say whatever we want. And that's an, an immense privilege. And I think it's what motivates a lot of people to stay longer here. There's a well, sense that if you the story, no one else will. The but the surveillance is really getting in the way. The risks are that they'll either kick you out or jail you. Have you ever felt close to being threatened uh, with, with either of those outcomes? Yeah, very much so. I think you normalize it a bit. And then you look back and you're like, actually, there's a lot of stuff that should worry me. For example, there was a trial last week for an Australian journalist who worked for the Chinese state broadcaster. So a bit different, a naturalized foreign citizen working for a Chinese state company, not my circumstance. But, you know, she's been put in detention for more than a year and a half now as she faces life in prison. What she's being accused of is essentially espionage, passing on state secrets, but like 
I th what they're accusing her of passing on is like GDP data, which is, first of all, mostly fabricated in China and to public knowledge at a certain point. And um, because they were investigating her, the, the last remaining Australian journalists in, in China fled the country. And um, yeah, I've, I've definitely um, felt a bit stressed about this. Uh, there has been a lot of negative coverage of me in the Chinese press in the last year. Um, I think I'm a pretty popular uh, target for a lot of the frustrations, I think, that are misplaced against the foreign media in China, because to be honest, I'm a woman and, I'm, and I have a Chinese face. And I think that leads to a lot of, for whatever reason, anger among Chinese nationalists in China. And the most worrying incident was last year, I had done a story in Guizhou province about poverty alleviation. Sensitive issue, but um, something that was talked a lot about in the Chinese press. And after doing that story, six months after doing that story, I was told that there had been a national security investigation into my reporting and to me. So, you know, I'm not going back to that province for at least probably another year. And, um, but nothing ever happened after that. Just, you kind of have to assess each situation as they come. After that happened, um, I met with people and officials in Beijing about it, and they had no idea that the investigation had happened. I mean, they were reading the same Chinese coverage that I was about the investigation. So it seemed really performative. But there might be some indications at some point that, you know, what they're doing or the allegations against me that I'm a foreign spy are not performative and are serious, and then I need to get the heck out. But right now, I think a lot of it is, is um, cynically speaking, mostly just to attract clicks you know, this helps local provincial outlets and governments and it doesn't really hurt them because it's in line with the way the political environment is going. Um, and it also maybe even, I think in, in the eyes of some, some Chinese officials works, you know, it might actually intimidate journalists into doing less, re uh, less critical reporting. I think it's the opposite. I think it makes people mad. So, um, so what do you and what do your editors do to protect you? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I know with the journal, we've just become very attuned to this over the last 20 years that, you know, we've got reporters overseas, uh, that they're often placed in dangerous positions. And, you know, so we have our own security operation, and, um, protocols for, for how to protect our people. What, what kind of things do you do to, to, to protect yourself? There's honestly not that much because. Uh, you cannot predict what, how, how public opinion and how the official stance against foreign journalists or myself is going to switch at any moment. But I'm in close contact with editors all the time. If I see something suspicious or someone reaches out with a weird request, then, then I immediately report that. So it's on the record at least with at least my editors, if not say the US Embassy. The US Embassy, which has been historically a bit distant, I think from journalists, um, has been much more in touch over the last couple of years after a number of American journalists were expelled and after there were uh, lawsuits and detentions of foreign journalists. And I think you just have to constantly monitor the situation. Right now, I don't think there's any reason for, the, for China to do anything, particularly against a US outlet. It's, it just wouldn't, wouldn't help its case, but maybe geopolitics will switch next year. And it, it, it may be a cost that and I don't think it actually would be that big of a cost. It might be a cost that China's willing to take on. Right. So um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your, your coverage of human rights issues, uh, which has gotten some attention, and, and also in particular your coverage of, of Muslim Uyghurs? Um, uh, what is the state of that reporting and how hard is it to do right? I got interested in, I mean, human rights, broadly speaking, because they're often just really compelling human stories. By nature, these stories are going to have a lot of pathos. Um, and I think the stories matter. Again, if you don't do them, I, I don't think at this point, the Chinese domestic press is going to be able to get into them in great detail. 
with the Xinjiang and Uyghur issue, it was the same, same thing. You know, I've just been really interested in the region. It has an amazing history and culture. And so it used to be an incredible place to visit because from a sociological perspective, it's completely different from the rest of the mainland. And at first you could go in person. I had a lot of really great reporting trips, mostly based on just going to Xinjiang in person and talking to people on background. That by 2018 was not really possible. Just the amount of monitoring in person that you got when you got to Xinjiang made talking to average people impossible or too risky. And so reporting shifted to more digital methods. And so you've seen a lot of digital journalism and forensic investigations into say state procurement documents, satellite analysis became really, really important for a number of years, particularly in mapping out the network of state security facilities and prisons that were being constructed. And then the diaspora community. I mean, enough of these populations live outside of China and have limited interaction with their communities inside China, that that also becomes a meaningful story to report on. But it, all of this is becoming more and more remote. I mean, all these methods I've described are reporting from afar. So you've got to do more due diligence, more cross-checking, and it might not be as immediate um, of reporting as, as you would like. It can be frustrating because you're using pretty indirect methods to get to, get to a fact. Um, but on the diaspora issue, that I think might be an interesting avenue for future China reporting. For people remaining here in the mainland, the morale has been incredibly low. I mean, I think that there is just not going to be a next round of China reporters who are cutting their teeth here in China, who are developing an interest in China, or who will even be able to just report on the ground in China for the next five years or so. That might change once they open up a bit from the pandemic and maybe if political controls loosen. But I think we're looking, we're facing a real dearth in the next couple of years in on the ground China reporting. A lot of it's going to move to bureaus in Taiwan and South Korea, maybe even in South, South and Southeast Asia. So from the periphery looking in, but there are also Chinese people everywhere. I mean, it's now a geopolitical story globally. And those tensions that you see with China vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world are going to be more important. Case in point, like the, the story of, in the Solomon Islands right now where, the, where China's trying to build a, a defense base. Um, and that happened only because the local Chinese population there were a target of anti-China riots last year. I mean, that's a diaspora story. And so I think we're going to see more and more of that. Right. All right. Well, um, Chrissy is worried about your voice. You live with your voice as uh, a podcast and radio reporter. Fine. Ironically, I have a very weak voice. We don't. We, we don't. We don't want to strain it. So I'm just going to ask you one last question, uh, unless there's any others. And that is, I started out uh, by talking about the ancient art of pigeon whistling, and so I'm wondering if you could tell us what that is, and if you can pigeon whistle yourself if you learned anything from that story about how to be a pigeon whistler. This was a story that I did for radio about pigeon whistles, which are really common in Northeast China, where I live. And they used to be ubiquitous. Like if you moved to Beijing 10 years ago, you would hear this weird whistling sound in the mornings. And that would be these bamboo, mostly bamboo whistles. You would tie to the back of the pigeon and then you send your flock up and it would make this haunting uh, kind of panpipe sound as the pigeons flew overhead. But because of urbanization, it's noise pollution, to be honest. And the fact that people are moving into high rise buildings means they can't raise pigeons anymore. And so pigeon whistles have disappeared, even though they've been um, a really important arts and craft since the Ming Dynasty. I did, after the story, buy some pigeon whistles and I can get them if you want. Give me like three seconds and I can go get them. Okay. And they're, they're quite precious to me because the person who made them uh, belongs to a, a, what's the word, like a, a guild of pigeon whistle makers that dates back to the Qing I dynasty. Pigeon whistling was like a bird call kind of thing. Uh, no, 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 no. And actually there are Chinese people who don't know what a pigeon whistle is. I, I yeah. They think it's, uh, there are a lot, if you ask a lot, this is how fast it's disappeared. If you ask Beijingers today, some people think that it's the pigeon who's literally whistling with their beak yeah. or the human who's whistling to communicate with their pigeons. But no, it's like this thing, I'll, I'll get it. Well, we'll, we'll hold on. Uh, 
Claire or Chrissy, do you have any programming notes that you want to share while we wait for the pigeon whistle to come back? Sorry, what did you say? I, I was wondering if you if you had any programming notes, but let's let's check out the pigeon whistle. And then this can... is they come in all shapes and sizes, but this is like a round one. And then this is the panpipe version. And then you can see <clears throat> little like notches here and so the wind blows over them and it makes a sound and you only need like six of these to make an incredibly loud sound even though the pigeons are flying 300 meters above your head you you can hear it it was in like and a kilometer diameter radius mm -hmm. they, they attach these things to the pigeons yeah all right so uh I think everyone is now going to get off this call and then Google pigeon whistling the Emily thing to see your story. Uh, but that's really cool. I have learned a lot from this conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, Chrissy, Claire, I'll let you take it from here. Yes, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Emily. Um, I got to say, I have my dog sleeping beside me and he was most interested in the pigeon whistle portion of the event. So thank you on his behalf. Um, <laughs> but but thank you all for coming. Uh, really appreciate having you all. Um, it's been such a great discussion. Um, and thank you for supporting the Chronicle. Um, it's a such a great student paper. And you know, I'm so lucky to uh, to have that in our backyard. So thank you all. A great community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Well, Have a great one, one last one last thing I'll say is uh, thank you for the work you're doing to inform the public, uh, Emily, and um, be safe out there. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thank you. I'm happy to take questions if people want. It's still early here, and I can stay on for a few more minutes. Cool. Chrissy, do we have more time? Sure. Sure. I see a question from Howard Goldberg about editor appetite for Howard was a former, stories. Howard was a former editor of the Chronicle to Emily after me. Mm. Thanks for the question, Howard. I, uh, I mean, so the biggest challenge is always trying to introduce a new beat essentially to editors. So when I first started reporting on Xinjiang, it was really difficult to convince my editors, the Financial Times at the time, that this was an important story but pretty quickly it became this global human rights issue. And then I couldn't do enough human rights stories about Xinjiang. So there's a little bit of a um, editor education. I mean, but this is why it's so great to have great editors because you're, you're constantly in dialogue with them. And as part of that discursive process, you become a better thinker and analyst yourself. You know, the best editor is the devil's advocate one who, who questions what you think all the time. Um, but, now there's a lot of appetite for these stories. I think it's just difficult to do them well. Well, tell us about some of the stories you're working on um, right now. You and I exchanged some emails talking about the issue of surrogacy. Uh, tell us about that story. Yeah, so I, there's no common theme to the stories that I'm interested in other than there are always great characters. You know, it's, oh, I think it's always about the people or the community that I'm reporting on that interests me. And so given that I'm trying to plan a trip back to the US, I wanted to do a story about surrogacy between the US and China. It's really, really popular to set up birth centers, um, which is a model that's very popular in China, by the way. There's this concept of doing a month of rest after you give birth. It is a folk medicine thing, but of course it's now become a very popular commercial practice as well. You pay like $10,000 and you live in a maternity care center where you're fed a special diet and you're not, not allowed to bathe and things like that. All of these traditional ideas about what's healthiest for a woman to recover after pushing a baby out. And those things are now in the US, but what's um, made this interesting is due to the pandemic and the fact that there are no direct flights still between the US and China. Some of those babies born in the US have not been able to come back and meet their parents in China. And I am curious about what, um, how that is going. By the way, there was also a lot of surrogacy happening in Ukraine. Not so much in the last couple of years after Crimea because some Chinese people rightfully saw that and saw, thought this is not a stable place to, to uh, have my children. But there were at least a couple of Chinese nationals who were arrested crossing the border without proper identification for young infants. And I would guess that those were Chinese surrogacy centers trying to get their, those babies out, out of Ukraine. 
We actually ended up being able to interview some people about that, but then they didn't want to go on record. But when you say surrogates, I'm pretty sure I understand this. So this is um, mothers bearing children in the United States for mothers in China. Yes, and also um, same-sex couples. Right, okay, okay. What, why would they come to do this in the United States and not do it in China? Good health care, pretty robust surrogacy uh, network. Like it's a established commercial practice in the US and American citizenship. So these are wealthier families? Yes, I mean, these are people who can shell out uh, $150,000. Right, okay. So um, you, there's a question here about supply chains, uh, in particular as it relates to um, clean energy, uh, solar, lithium, uh, raw materials. Um, and I'm curious about this from an even broader macro perspective, but the question from Julian is, um, is, is China's role at the center of the supply chain seen there as an advantage, um, a geopolitical advantage for the Chinese? My question related to that is when you talk to Western executives, um, what are they thinking about their place in China and whether they, they want to uh, keep so much of their global supply chain centered in that place? Thanks for the question, Julian. It's great to see you. I think definitely China sees its dominant role as an advantage. I think it depends on the material as well. So for solar, that was a very intentional advantage. That was something that they set, sat down and designed industrial policy to create. And it happened overnight, basically overnight, over the course of like a decade. And it required a lot of state support, particularly at the local government level. There was a lot of waste. I mean, there were huge numbers of very, very small polysilicon factories that went out of business because they just couldn't make stuff, good stuff, um, cost effectively. It turns out it's quite dangerous to make that stuff. Um, but it's happened and, and now uh, they China makes most solar panels. Um, with battery material, I think that's become more of a global story um, because batteries are just more complex than solar panels. So there are rare earth minerals, as you know, that are mined here. I wonder if there's going to be a bit more of a backlash now against just how dirty it is to refine that here in China, but they seem pretty intense still on, still on um, shoring up their dominance in that. But there's been some really interesting reporting that, um, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, you've probably seen all this stuff. You know, I'm just reading, reading this reporting. I'm not doing it myself. Looking at how battery um, components have been mined in places like Africa or South Asia and the interaction between Chinese state companies, mostly it's state companies and local communities have been, have been over that. Uh, how about U.S. executives? Do you, have, do you have any conversations with them about what kind of presence they want to maintain in China or whether they want to be diversifying their supply chains out of business? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I think the last two years have actually been really kind to foreign executives because despite the global pandemic, they've had a captive and very large domestic market here. And so the American Chamber of Commerce, for example, reported some of its best figures for the last three years in, in their latest report that came out late last year. Uh, they're here not so much to serve the global market. They're setting up factories and supply chains here to mostly serve the Chinese market, um, particularly for like, um, you know, food brands or, or healthcare brands and things like that. But again, with the Shanghai lockdown, you might see that as a turning point. And that's something I want to look into for the next couple of months, because it may be that what made China a stable place to ship and make things is also going to be a source of instability if you've got to combat every tiny small outbreak that happens every few days. Right, right, okay. Um, so let me see. Uh, oh, Anne was, uh, we, we were asking, Anne is asking you about burner phones. Oh, burner phones. Yeah. Um, not really, I have two phones. One of them I use for work and the other I also use for work, but contains like messaging apps and, and Chinese apps. But there's no perfect solution. And um, at a certain point, you just got to think, what is the cost of trying to be sure that no one's listening 
it's just too high, it's too onerous and kind of accept it. And Anne also had a question about China's influence in Africa. Is it waning or growing? I would love to get into that question on the ground. I mean, Africa is one of those places like East or West Africa where I would love to go right after China. I don't think it's immediately in the cards, but maybe in the, in the, in the medium term. I think um, it's still quite strong. I think it took a bit of a hit early on in the pandemic when China basically expelled all of the African traders and exporters that were living in the south of China for COVID reasons. I mean, it was incredibly racist, but it was also to get rid of unwanted foreigners because there was this, there still is this perception that foreigners are more susceptible to getting and passing on the virus here. And that was a massive soft power blow to a lot of Africans who had studied here, who thought that China was their future and then saw people who had lived here for sometimes decades have to return back to the continent. But in general, I think it's still quite robust and I and what is interesting to me is I get the sense that there is more civil society and private industry links between China and entrepreneurs moving to Africa and really putting down roots in places like Uganda or Kenya or Nigeria, you know, relatively stable places. Um, whereas in some of the more unstable places, it's still mostly state companies. But I'm curious to see how that like more um, people centered organic tie between China and the rest of Africa is developing. I've got one, one final question and then I'll wrap it up. Um, it, you, you talk about industrial policy as it relates to solar panels. And I've been debating with my colleagues about industrial policy because on the one hand, it looks like industrial policy in the solar realm is an example of the, the Chinese government kind of leading to domination of an industry. On the other hand, I look at the problems that they've had developing a vaccine, um, and it makes me wonder if industrial policy really is um, the, the, the powerful tool that, uh, that, that some people have come to see it to be in a place like China. So what's your view on industrial policy and whether it works? Mm, I mean, people do an entire entire PhDs on this topic, John. So I think it's, it, it depends have, is have, the consensus. Seconds to... <laughs> you know, there are countries that have done it well. China has studied Germany really, really closely, for example. And I think there are also certain sectors that lend themselves better to, to top-down industrial policy than, than others. Like for example, semiconductors probably do really well with state industrial policy because it just requires so much money, upfront capital and coordination but maybe something like vaccines does not. I think with the vaccines, unfortunately, it's been really political. I think it is possible for China to make an mRNA vaccine and they've made ones and they're clinically trying, uh, testing them out right now in other countries that have higher rates of, of COVID. But um, the whole mRNA thing has been outright political. The Pfizer has been trying to get a commercial application here, you know, approved by the, the Chinese FDA essentially for the last year and a half, almost two years. And they've never heard back about that because China wants to have its own mRNA vaccines. Um, and they're gonna get one, they will make one. It's a question of time. And I think it's it's now become increasingly important because they need to open up in stages soon and they need that darn vaccine that they can, they can start giving people. Um, but uh, what's holding it up is often political rather than rather than the policy itself. It's China's right. also been much more um, low key about industrial policy. I think it freaked a lot of people out because to like put out reports saying we want to take over these sectors by 2025 was probably not great messaging and was like a little bit too obvious and on the nose. And so they've really dialed back that that policy making in the last couple of years. I, I would also say just um, ultimately it's innovation that drives economies and prosperity in the long run. And I don't think industrial policy is the greatest engine for innovation in an economy. Um, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, Chrissy, Claire, everyone else, thank you so much. If you guys, I'll let you kind of take it from there. Yeah, thank you all so much. We, uh, we really appreciate it and hope everyone has a, a good evening. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining.